Thank you very much. Very sorry for this delay. I think my old Mac is to blame. I should get rid of it at some point. It's quite old. Um, I tried it yesterday, but the connection is a bit shaky. Um, so today, I talk about swarms and some work on machine learning. And, uh, but I want to start with architecture, because actually there's at least one architect in the audience. Um, As you may uh, know or not, um, it is um, Mies van der Rohe who coined the phrase, less is more. And uh, he also designed beautiful buildings of minimalist design, like the Barcelona Pavilion that you can see here. And it's striking to think about that this was already 1929, so a long time ago, way ahead of its time. And uh, the ideas to use less rather than more in design is fa fairly universal. And uh, many people in swarm robotics are using it as well. Um, Deborah explained well how outcome, algorithm, and environment um, are related, so I'm not going over this again. Um, but what we are interested in is um, not how much information processing does a particular agent need to do in a group, but how little, in a sense. That's the emphasis. <clears throat> and let's take a look at this in a particular context of uh, a task where a bunch of robots have to gather in one place. So in our framework that we call computation-free, um, the robots have uh, simple senses that give some discrete value. For example, there could be a line of sight sensor, and the line of sight sensor tells what color the object is you're pointing towards. Um, in this case, uh, the line of sight sensor is just binary. So at any moment in time, the robot knows is there another robot in front of it or not. And we assume that the, the range of the sensor is actually infinite. Um, so using one bit of information, as we will show, uh, is sufficient if you have embodied robots to solve this particular task. So how do the robots move? They have two wheels. They can turn uh, on the spot, move forward, backward, and so on. So each of these wheels can be set to continuous velocity from minus one to one. And uh, now the question is, what is the control policy? So we're not just interested in the outcome, we're interested in a policy that maps input to output. And uh, we are assuming that we have robots without any state. So there's no runtime memory. And if you make this assumption, then the only thing you can do is map input to output. Anything, I mean, everything you do is just a map from input to output. Uh, so in our case, we have a binary sensor value and for each of the possible values, we have to determine what is the velocity of the left wheel and what is the velocity of the right wheel. So as long as the sensor reading doesn't change, you keep moving with exactly the same velocity profile, the pair of wheel velocities. In total, we have four parameters here. The two, two wheel velocities if there is a, a robot in front of you and the two wheel velocities if there isn't a robot in front of you. Now, how do you optimize these four parameters? And uh, I want to uh, be upfront. We use a lot of computation in the optimization process. We use a simulation framework. We are using uh, like search algorithms to find a suitable controller. And there's a lot of computation involved in this. However, once we have found a suitable controller, we can upload this onto the robot. And from there on, the robot does no longer need to perform arithmetic computations. So this is the function that we are going to optimize. And uh, PIT is the position of robot I at time T. And essentially, this function um, tries to minimize how far a robot is away from the average position of all of the robots, the squared distances. And there's some normalization. Uh, small r is just the, the radius of the robot. Now, when you optimize this function, 
um, I cannot show you all, uh, all information here because we have four parameters. It's a bit difficult to visualize. But what you see here is um, if you choose a particular set of parameters, two parameters in a certain way, uh, what is the maximum performance you obtain the other two parameters chosen to your advantage? And um, so, for example, if, if, you have, if you are a robot and you have another robot in front of you, actually you do not know how far the other robot is away, it could be 50 meter away, it could be touching, um, it is obviously not good to move away. Yeah, so, so you don't want to move backward. That is a very bad performance. What is interesting is um, the best thing to do is um, to turn clockwise or counterclockwise. So when you're turning clockwise or counterclockwise, I mean on the spot, you're not changing your position. So that means you're not approaching the other robot by, by even a millimeter. And that's a bit counterintuitive because we wanted to approach other robots, we wanted to get close to them. So the answer to this uh, is that the robots are approaching the other robots not when they see them, but when they don't see them. And you can um, geometrically analyze this. In the interest of time, I skip this, actually. <laughs> um, but you can prove analytically that two robots simultaneously moving uh, will find each other in quadratic time. Now, we have tested this with three robots. So we have robots in the lab. Uh, we, we, they are called EPACs. Uh, they have two wheels, and they have a camera on the front. And in an extreme case, a single pixel is sufficient to tell whether there's a robot in front or not. Um, you can see here an example. 40 robots, this is 16 times through speed. And we did 30 of these trials, and almost all of them, the robots aggregated into a single cluster. So a few points about this collective behavior. Um, first of all, um, looking at it, it looks complex to me, like in the sense that you have some collective movements of groups and not just individual robots. Um, and uh, it looks also, um, while, while it may be inefficient in terms of the time to generate everything, um, the result is, is very compact. You can see some hexagonal pattern in there, which is known to be very good. Um, also, the robots that are inside the structure they see other robots at all times. So what should they do? They turn on the spot, which is, what, which is a good choice. The alternative to stop wouldn't be necessarily a good choice because then two robots that see each other but are far away would stop and they would never aggregate. Hmm. So in the second part of the talk, we talk about machine learning. And we will come back to this particular behavior I've shown. And, uh, the question when you are interested in machine learning is something like this. Given this trajectory data, and that's actually trajectory data from one of the real robots here, given this trajectory data, what was the rule to generate it? And we're not just interested in predicting trajectories. We're interested in knowing, like Deborah said, the algorithm that, that takes input into account to produce it. And we know the trajectory, but we do not know the input that generated it. So that's the second part of the talk. But let's finish the first. There's many more other problems, interesting, other than aggregation, uh, that you could uh, look at, like circle formation, that can be used with the same framework. Another problem is that of clustering, not the robots themselves, but other objects. So these are passive objects. They don't move. But if you program robots using our framework, they start clustering them. In this case, the robot doesn't have a binary sensor, but it has a sensor that returns a ternary digit. The sensor is explained here on the left. So the robot can either see nothing, or it can see another robot, or it can see an object. So there's three possible states. And for each of these sensor input states, 0, 1, 2, say, you have to choose a velocity profile, a pair of real velocities. So here we have six parameters, and we used genetic algorithms to, to optimize it. 
Um, some of you are interested in collective choice and consensus problems. So we have also tried whether a group of robots that um, doesn't perform arithmetic computations are able to choose b between two equal options that are presented to them. And they are unable to discriminate between these two options. Uh, so it's a, it's a purely matter of random choice whether they go for the left one or for the right one. And I think 96 or 97 percent of our trials, we did 50 trials, um, the majority of the robots ended up near one of the objects. There are some um, also quite incredibly complex tasks we learned yesterday about cooperative transport. So we did some work on this. Um, and we came up with a, an, an elegant way uh, to transport an object towards a goal, assuming that the goal is not very far away. Um, so suppose you are a robot, you're traveling around and you find an object that you want to bring back to the nest. Um, now, if the nest is somewhere nearby, you can, you can assume that um, if you can see the nest, you probably don't want to push the robot because you're going to push it in, in the wrong direction. So here we assume the object is fairly tall. The robots are very small. So whenever the robots are behind the object, they won't see the, the, the goal or they won't see the nest. So the robots are programmed to push perpendicular to the object, but only if they are in the occluded area. And then you can um, represent this is a particular object, but you can make a generalization. You can go to differential uh, curves, and if they are uh, closed and um, if they are uh, convex, you can prove mathematically that um, this strategy eventually will bring the object back to the goal under some assumptions. A lot of assumptions, like they need to be uniformly distributed, an infinite number of point robots and quasi-static movement. Now, you can implement this strategy using um, a swarm of robots like we did in our laboratory. And in this case, they use the arithmetic computation. They find the robot. They use some kind of neural networks to learn how to push. And we can actually predict the trajectory that the object takes and compare against the experiment. So, uh, an object that is uh, round uh, and symmetrical will be pushed along um, a straight path. For example, this particular object will follow a curved trajectory and so on. Um, under the assumption that they uniformly distribute in the occluded area, which is not always the case. Um, interestingly, the whole algorithm doesn't need any communication between the robots. So there's no explicit information passing between the robots. The robots are, however, aware of each other. They are, they are avoiding bumping into each other. We also implemented this in simulation, and this is where we used our computation-free framework. Uh, I won't go here to too much detail, but essentially in 3D, you can have robots that stick to something and propel, uh, bring it back to some goal. We developed recently um, the first robot that moves by routing fluid through itself. And uh, this is a modeler robot. It's composed of many, many units you can attach together. And uh, these units, they are put in an aquatic environment. And they, can, they have pumps inside. And they can, um, if you turn on this pump over here, it will remove fluid from within the robot to the outside into the environment. And all the passive pumps will let the fluid in. And we can implement our occlusion-based controller that we just discussed to move such a robot towards a light source, like a task you call phototaxis. So if the light source is towards the right, like in the video, all the pumps that are facing away from the light source um, will be active and will kind of help the robot to propel, whereas the other pumps will let the fluid in. And you can actually prove, this is not published, but we are working on this, um, that even robots of concave shape of any arbitrary morphology will be able uh, to get near to the goal under this simple policy. 
which doesn't require communication, it doesn't require memory, it doesn't require arithmetic computation. Um, and these potential robots, they, they, they can potentially be quite powerful. If you think about a three-dimensional version like you see here, um, or maybe you can't, I don't know, but um, think about a cube, a 10 by 10 by 10 cube. So you have 1,000 modules. You have 600 external faces. And on each face, there is a pump that can be on or off. That gives you two by the power of 600 possibilities how you can fire the pumps or not. It's a lot of possibilities also for the robot to move. Now, I have one, one more um, part before going to the machine learning, and that's on synchronization. Um, some of you may be interested um, in um, mobile coupled oscillators. These are agents that move around in their environment. And uh, this is about synchronizing their clocks in a distributed way. Each of these agents can fire. And uh, once they fire, all the agents that are in the neighborhood um, are going to update their faces. So one of the cru crucial questions is, what's the velocity of the agent, as we will see, and also, what is the neighborhood model? And there's different types of neighborhood models. For example, the nearest neighbor, the K nearest neighbor, or a cone of vision connectivity. Cone of vision means, for example, uh, you have an animal, it has a cer certain perceptual field, a cone, and whenever someone flashes within this field, you're updating your own face. Now you can see here some of the robots in our lab. Um, this is again these EPAC robots, and they are not, they're starting uh, being out of sync, but after a while, actually it takes quite long, they are, um, they are beautifully in sync. So, and that's not maybe very surprising that you can program them to do this. Uh, what is more interesting, and if you are more interested in this, check also the original paper by Pregnano in, in Physical Review Letters. Um, is that the, the velocity, there's a non-monotonic non, non dependence between the synchronization time and the velocity of each agent. So all the robots move with a constant speed, and if the speed is medium, it takes very long to synchronize. So it would be better for the agents to move slower or faster. And this is data from the actual physical robot experiment. Mm. Here there's some simulation. Imagine you have N robots, and they start being synchronized. And now you perturb a single robot by a small epsilon. And you measure the time it takes for the whole system to reach consensus again. A small perturbation to a single agent in a swarm. Now, if the agents move slow or fast, the time is linear with the group size. And that's the log scale. Um, if, if the agents move in the medium re intermediate regime, the time grows exponential with group size to reject the disturbance that you applied to a single agent, which is uh, a situation akin of stable chaos. So the last part of the talk is about this machine learning. And um, in general, in machine learning, you have models that produce data, and you have systems that produce data, and you're interested to comparing these. You want that the model becomes like your system. You will usually have a similarity metric for this. And um, interestingly, coming back to Deborah's talk, um, we're not just interested in outcomes and matching outcomes. In a sense, we want to match the algorithms that are behind. Now, recently, um, there have been attempts to kind of replace these type of metrics. So one of the issues with the metrics is that sometimes if you do, don't choose a suitable metric, you will get something that you thought is similar but in fact isn't. So like a good, a good um, metric would be maybe the KL divergence, which measures the, the difference of two distributions essentially. However, you do not normally have the distribution. You just have, let's say, 100 trajectory data. And Typically, not even two of these trajectories will be identical. So how can you measure a distribution? Um, 
So there is a new family of machine learning algorithms. Um, we introduced uh, in Gecko 2013, we proposed to replace the metrics by discriminators that evolve and that compete against the models. And a year later, um, GANs emerged at a NIPS conference, uh, which I'm sure many of you will have heard about. Um, and uh, at the latest NIPS, we um, presented a paper how to generalize GANs uh, using a framework that uh, since a couple of years we, we termed Turing learning. So what's the difference? How does it work? So in Turing learning and any type of GAN algorithms, rather than a fixed metric, you have some metric that evolves. So you have a discriminator that is trained to label data that comes from the other side. So it can be from the model or from the system, and you train the discriminator for labeling correctly the data. And at the same time, you train the model to fool the discriminator. And uh, as the system is so similar to the Turing test, you essentially just have two agents that are learning and they're competing against each other. We are calling this uh, Turing learning. And generative adversarial networks are just one example where the model is a generative model. Now, let's look at one case study. Imagine you have a, a swarm behavior and you want to understand what these robots do. So these robots, they are clustering some objects similar like, like you have seen before. And uh, essentially, first we need to ex explain what is the training data. The training data in this instance could be the trajectory data. So these robots are moving around, the blue robots are moving around, and uh, they could be animals, they, they could be real animals that you're actually tracking. In our case, this is in simulation, so we actually know what rules they follow, but we are not using this knowledge. The good thing of this is, at the end, because we know the ground truth, we can compare whether what, what we inferred is actually correct. And uh, we will also introduce a replica agent. So we have a simulator, we just add another agent, and we assume that we know what is the morphology of this agent, but we do not know the control. So here we are inferring the six parameters that these other agents use. So we try to learn what parameters they use in order to cluster. So when, whenever we put a model onto the red replica, this will produce a trajectory. So the discriminators will um, essentially take they, they are neural networks that take as input um, a trajectory. And they have to tell, is it the trajectory coming from a red agent, from the replica, or from the blue agent? That's the task of the discriminator. And uh, then we use an optimization process to, we have a population of discriminators and we have a population of models. And they are both competing like in the co-evolutionary sense. We are using an evolutionary algorithms uh, the, for the discriminator, which is a recurrent neural network, we are, uh, the genotype is the, the neural network weights, and they are, they are just trained using a standard evolutionary algorithm. And uh, the fitness function is the fraction of correct judgment. So that's a fitness function that is generic, is not task dependent, it doesn't depend whether you want to learn about a swarm or whether you want to learn about a human. Um, and for the model, the fitness is the fraction of times it misleads the classifier, the, the discriminator. So again, these are fitness functions, they are fairly universal, they, they, don't, they don't depend on particular tasks. So now you can see some example results. So this is after 100 generations. You can see the replicas trying to join in the group, but to, to us humans it's very simple to see it's, it's not doing the right thing. It's like the continental driver in, in Great Britain uh, moving on the wrong lane, as I did quite often. <laughs> um, now, after 200 generations and me living for eight years in Sheffield, um, I have also uh, greatly adapted, and I drive more, on the, more likely on the correct lane. Mm. And after 1,000 generations, you actually you cannot tell the difference. So, and uh, the, the nice thing is, not only we get fooled when we look at it, but actually uh, the parameter values, when you compare to the ground truth, are... Uh, uh, are where they're supposed to be. The ground truth here indicated with the dashed, dashed lines. 
So this is like the controller, the parameters of the controller we inferred. Had we used a metric-based evolution, this is what we would have obtained. So we did this. And in this paper, we have also uh, like formally proven that the global optimum of least square metrics is not the correct behavior. And it's a bit like this. Think about the agent moves 50% of the time to the left and 50% of the time it moves to the right. And let's say whether you move to the left or to the right depends on an input. But if you learn from trajectory data, you do not have access to the input. So what the least square method does is says you're moving forward 100% of the time, which means an error of 90 degrees, and that's, that's minimizing the least square metric. So it's, it's telling you the, the wrong answer in 100% of the cases. Turing learning, instead, without knowing the input, can infer the correct distribution, as you can see over here. The next thing was kind of something straightforward. We didn't want to, to continue in simulation, so rather we said, can we do this in the real world without any simulation whatsoever? So here we are learning um, directly from data generated by, by the trajectories from real robots, and we use the aggregation as an example. So we have an overhead camera in our lab that monitors the replica and also the other agents. Uh, the blue agents, they have some known rule to aggregate, and the red agent, can, we can upload via Bluetooth some, some candidate model, and then we can generate trajectory data. And the whole Turing learning algorithm is running on an external computer. This is the trajectory data, uh, sorry, th th this is the results. This, this is the four parameters we inferred in 10 co independent coevolutions, and each time, uh, despite noise on sensors, noise on actuators, and noise on the tracking system, we were accurately inferring the parameters of the system without seeing the inputs, but just from the trajectory data. So we are, we are not just inferring the outcome, we are inferring a policy to produce output from input. Some further results in the paper are that we infer the control structure as well. Um, we also uh, refer, we also infer the morphologic to some extent, like the, the, the perceptual field of view. And uh, we study what happens if you look at swarms of replicas, if you separate them from the, the swarms of the agents. Sometimes you don't want to mix things because the replica may influence the, the rest of the group. So you could have a, a swarm of simulated replicas and a swarm of, let's say, real animals um, and, and so forth. Um, so in the last part, um, now we talk about um, active learning. And that's another way we are generalizing over what's currently possible using GANs. In GANs, you're learning passively. And that means that the data you're presented with um, is just passively taken. And you're, you're confronted with this data. And then you have to decide, as a discriminator, is this correct or not. But some models are very good in some aspects, but, but very bad in others. So training these models using uh, uniformly sampled data is not smart. What you really want is you want to put the model into uh, a situation where it is most likely to perform poorly. You want to reveal the weaknesses of the model. And that's exactly what happens in the Turing test. Because in the Turing test, you didn't have a passive human that makes judgments. You had, a, you had an interrogator that asks questions and has a dialogue. And via this active learning approach, you can learn much faster and more accurately if the behavior you want to learn is, is, is complex. Here, the behavior we want to learn is a probabilistic finite state machine. So the agent that we want to learn about is responding to stimuli in the environment. And that's so important also for biologists, because whatever behavior you observe it is only meaningful in the context in what it was produced. So the idea is, rather than letting the context drift at random, we are controlling the context. The discriminator in our work is not only making a judgment on whether the data is genuine or not, it will, it will set the conditions under which the data was produced. In this case, turning off and on the light, controlling a stimulus. And by doing so, we, get, we are able to more accurately 
um, determine the parameters. So in red, you can see how close we are to the ground truth of the parameters of this finite state machine, like probabilities of transitions and the particular behaviors in the states. The alternative is not to control the stimulus, but to let it drift using a random process, for example. Then you are learning. You, you may even be aware of the, the stimulus, but you are not aware. Uh, you, you cannot control it, and uh, you are unable to infer some of these um, states because you are unlikely to observe them. It's a bit like when you're interacting with a human and you want to really understand their full repertoire of behavior, then you have to put them in lots of different states, right? So maybe you increase the temperature of the room or something. So there's a lot of possibilities. But if you do not do this, you're unlikely to observe these things. That, that's why, why learning by interaction is potentially more powerful. And that's just another example of it. Um, here we didn't want to learn the behavior of the agent. We wanted, to, um, we wanted to learn more the morphology of it. So in a sense, there is a robot that doesn't know where its senses are. It has zero calibration. It has to find out by itself, where are my senses? It has eight senses to detect obstacles, but the sensors could be all pointing to the front or pointing to the back or, or, or in a different way. And the robot, not only does it not know where its sensors are, it also does not know where does it start in the environment. So it's a chicken and egg problem. You don't know where the obstacle is. You don't know where the sensor is to sense the obstacle. And you can solve this using Turing learning, but only if the discriminator is allowed to interact. In this case, the discriminator is a neural network. It takes sensor readings, and it has to tell, are they coming from a calibrated robot or not? But not only this. The discriminator controls the movements of the robot while the sensor readings are produced. So this is what we call closed loop control. And uh, the discriminator learns to move in a way to maximally help its discrimination task. That's what we call like active learning. And as you can see again, similar to before, we, we, we obtain um, better results using this. So to conclude, um, we have um, initially talked about this computation-free swarming. By no means there is no comp computation at all because we have, um, first of all, to generate the controllers. We have lots of computation. And also, you can argue that there's uh, morphological computation, as we heard about in the, in the last few days. Uh, but what our robots don't need is an arithmetic logic unit to um, to perform any, any computations because what they do is so simple, you can directly store it using a couple of transistors. And we have seen robots that are so basic that they can move using binary actuators and binary sensors and use this framework uh, without any runtime memory and, uh, and any, any sophistication, not even communication among them. So this is a possible way kind of to aggressively push towards simpler and simpler robots that maybe one, one day can be implemented at uh, the micron scale or even below. And the second part, I talked about the Turing learning. And um, this is about ligand guns to learn without the predefined metrics. Because whenever you have a metric, you, only, you will get what the metric gives you. And uh, so in the Turing tests and in the Turing learning, you have you have discriminators that take on the role of emulating, finding a suitable metric. And uh, the only thing you care about is interdistinguishability. You want that the data that is produced from your model is indistinguishable from the data that is produced by the system. You don't care about how similar and so on. It's just the interdistinguishability. Um, so this during learning, we have applied in behavioral inference. Um, and uh, we have showed that uh, in the interactive learning approach that for some problems, you can learn faster if um, you are allowed to interact with the process. Um, and I think this is a kind of um, a powerful possibility because if you are interested in animal behavior, um, it is so vital to understand the context in which the animals are placed, the environment. 
And uh, so we can now close the loop by making experiments where computers control the conditions under which animals are observed and use this information to reason about how, how the animals uh, possibly uh, perform. And if, if the models are very weak and do not capture well how the animal performs under certain conditions, then certainly the discriminators will pick these particular conditions. And then the model, they, they kind of, um, um, they, they lose out. And they, then there's, there's a pressure, like there's adaptive value, to, so to speak, for the models in the optimization process to improve on the parts where they are weak. And this is like a continuous arms race, like, like you know from coevolution. So I would like to uh, say there's a few more research that I didn't present, one on Brazil nut effect. So we study segregation and robotics using this. We work a bit on uh, cooperative transport versus solitary transport uh, using rules from solitary transport and see whether you can transport in groups. Rodent huddling, thermal regulation, uh, self-assembly, multi armor Bennett, and a few more. And uh, the, the work I presented today was mostly done by my PhD students on the left, in particular the ones in bold face, and some other collaborators like Andreas Kolling uh, and Rüdiger Zilma from Unilever. And I think this was my last slide, yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs>